Hello everyone, my name is Victor Wooten. I'm inviting you to join me on the Extraordinary Bass Player Show. Well, welcome. Welcome back to the Extraordinary Bass Player Show. As you know, I'm your host, Sharon Moore. You know, I always say, today, today, today. Well, family, my guest today, I guess it's been said, he doesn't need an intro, a introduction. As I told Gary Baldwin, we could talk about breakfast or something. <laughs> you know who he is. I'll start by saying he's a five-time Grammy Award winner. You remember him from working with Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones. He's an author. We'll talk later about his record company, Vix Records. He was voted top 10, one of the top 10 bass players in the world by Rolling Stone magazine, which is really cool, by the way. <laughs> you all know him from his family band, the Wooten Brothers, which helped me welcome my guest today and a fine bassist he is, Victor Wooten. Hey, Victor. Uh Hold on, we need some applause. Let me see if I got some, we got some. <laughs> That's a first, Victor. That's a first. <laughs> Bring my own applause, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's cold. Bring my old applause. The old guys would say, That's cold blooded. <laughs> yeah, right. uh. so, I guess I'll, I'll go back and do a little bit of history, as I said before. Well, let me say it again. Um, welcome to Extraordinary Bass Player Show. I appreciate you being here. I'm happy to be here. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks for having me. <laughs> well, I'll do a little history, then I'll move around a little bit. I heard somewhere, I read that you're originally from Virginia, is it? Yeah, I got uh, my family moved to Virginia when I was and just starting the third grade, so that would have made me what, around eight or so. Just starting the third grade, dad was military, so we moved a lot. But I'm the youngest of five brothers, so I moved around the least. Well, we settled in Virginia, and I, I was there until quite a few years after high school. Ah, I wanna talk a little bit about someone I hope I get to meet one day, your brother Reggie. I wanna talk about brother Reggie, man. That's a bad dude, man. The way he groomed you, the way he introduced you, the way he did that. Let me ask some 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 fun stuff right around that, and I'll, and I'll move on. But I want to stay there for a little bit. Where's that little plastic guitar at now? You still have it? <laughs> <laughs> no. And you know what? I really wish I did. Um, I do have my first bass. It's, it's here somewhere. I see it. Yeah. Uh, my first bass. It looks like Paul. It looks like uh, Paul McCartney's Hofner that he played with the Beatles. But mine was a uh, a Univox, a copy. But my parents were looking for something small that I that I could play because I was real young. So that was my my first real bass. But that little plastic thing we had when we lived in Hawaii. I don't know where that thing is. I sh I sure wish I still had it. That was awesome. You talked about. And uh, you, 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 the fans, you've seen these in the videos. You talked about how learning, and we're not going to go down that road. I'll just give a little, little bit about that. But learning English and then learning music, and, and, and that was just, oh, just awesome how you put that two together. Thank it's kind of sort of the same time, but the same way. And no one ever tells you how to do that. You watch and you learn, you know. And so that was awesome. I got to applaud you for that. Hit the applaud thing again for me. <laughs> <laughs> Stay close to that thing. We're going to be coming back to that thing. <laughs> you know, while I'm right there, I want to ask you, I'm sure the fans will be elated before it makes it to the Smithsonian uh, Museum. Show us that base. Okay. Um if you've seen, like, the, I think the cover of my record called What Did He Say? I'm holding this bass, like, down, down my back. I got my back to the, to the uh, camera, 
and my bass is going down. But yeah, this is my first bass here. But who knows if somebody you know wanted to put this one in, um, I'd I'd be open to it. What do you look for in a drummer, and when you're playing with him, and what do you anchor yourself to in the drummer? Most the time, people say the bass player anchors to the kick drum. I had uh, Robin Dewey from Frankie Beverly Mays on, and he said, and this surprised me as well as other bass players, he said he anchors himself to the hi-hat, yeah. which I thought was interesting. What do you look for in a drummer, and what do you anchor yourself to as a bass player within the drummer? Great question. Great question. Um, first of all, I will say what I look for in any musician is the same thing I would look for in a best friend. And literally, someone who listens to me, someone who I enjoy listening to them, someone who has nothing to prove to me, and I don't feel like I have to prove myself to them, someone that I enjoy being around. What do you think of the bass guitar coming from four strings to now 10 strings? And have you ever tried the 10 string? My brother Reggie has a crazy string. I don't even know how many it is. Higher than I can count. But... Here's the way I look at all instruments. Like I have, I'm in a room right now with a bunch of instruments. And if you listen closely, you don't hear a thing. And it's because instruments don't make music. People do. So what I suggest is that you find an instrument that makes you so comfortable that you forget it's there. And then you make the bet, you make the music. It's trying to like, it's like asking all the players in the NBA or Michael Jordan or Steph Curry or LeBron, what's the best tennis shoe? You know, tennis shoe never scored a point. You got to, they're going to wear the shoe that makes them the most comfortable so that they can play the best ball. So if it's four strings, if it's five, six, it's up to you. It depends on what makes you the most comfortable. But I will add this to it. Sometimes, Sharon, I get asked to play some music where a low B, a fifth, low, a, a, a fifth string is needed. Or I might be playing a jazz gig where the upright bass is needed. Or I might be playing some, you know, something where they need a higher melody than my four string. So I need a six string or a high, you know, a five string with a high C. The music might dictate what I need to play. But if I want to be comfortable, I'm going to play a four string fretted bass. Does that give you enough room on the fly to get to other places that you need to, that a normal five or six can get you there? Yes. Normally. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Normal I can four. make you, uh, with a four string that doesn't have a low B, I can make sure, I can make you not miss it. I really can. But um, I also, also, uh, I can show you, there's a thing that a company makes. I don't have my bass plugged in at the moment, but there's a company that makes a thing called a hip shot. And what it is, is this little lever. So right now it's, that's an E, but if I flip this lever, drops it down a whole step. So now I'm at a D, right? And I've also practiced a lot of tuning, meaning tuning is something that I've practiced. So if I can have an E, now hit that lever, that's a whole step down to a D. If I do this, right? That now I'm down another whole step with just one or two turns to a C. That's only a half step away from a low B. So if I need to get down to a low B, I can do it really easily. You know? Victor, let me ask you this one. What's your least favorite key to play in and why? Well, least favorite key. I don't know that I have one. Um, I don't, oh man, maybe, maybe E flat, E flat major or E flat minor, possibly just because it's so like bass players and guitar players. We like to play an E because I got that low open string. I can put my thumb on it. I don't even got to think about it, but E flat is a little different because it's so close to home that it can get hard, you know, because I don't have a low E flat. So I could tune my string down a half step and it shifts the whole bass off just one half step. So that's a little confusing. 
But it's not that I don't like it, but that is kind of a difficult key, E flat or D flat, D flat, you know. So I don't know, I haven't thought about that, but those are some difficult ones, more difficult for me, E flat and D flat. I asked Charles Glenn, bass player that played with Little Richard for 30 something years and so on and so forth, what's his least favorite key? He said F, because of where it's at, the physicality of it, hole in it, and he yeah. found a way to hold it. It's just holding it up there. He said. Right. That I understand. But F is so common in jazz because that's a key that horn players like. Horn players like F and B flat. They like the flat keys, you know, the keys that have flats in them like F or B flat or E flat, like I said earlier. But guitarists, we like the open strings. We like E and G and A and D, those kind of things. But playing a lot of jazz, F is pretty comfortable for me. To talk about a bass a bass player making mistakes as they play. Mm -hmm. How do they comp? So forth, their mm -hmm. head, the workplace, so forth and so on. Sure, a mistake doesn't mean what you did was wrong. A mistake just means that's not what I meant to do. But if you think about it, I'm I'm fifty nine. Music's been around a whole lot longer than fifty nine years. So why would I want everything to go my way, right? When I don't know that much, right? So if you can, one way to look at a mistake is maybe it's music, because music's been around a lot longer than us. Maybe music is pushing you in a different direction, possibly, right? Sometimes if you're driving the car, you take a wrong turn, you see something more unexpected. Whoa, I never seen that before. But really what the key is and what makes it fun is how you're gonna get out of that mistake. And musicians as a whole, we don't practice that. Right, we're in sport, let's say basketball, when they know every shot's not gonna go on. I heard my friend Anthony Wellington, great bass player, teacher say this one time. He said, basketball players know that every shot's not going in. So what do they do? Because they know they're not going to make everything. They practice rebounding. They have drills. They practice it. They're, they prepare for a mistake. Musicians don't prepare as a whole. We don't prepare for a mistake. We get good at making a mistake and stopping in practice rather than recovery. Right? I've heard uh, attributed to Miles Davis and a few other people, you make a mistake, make it again. Make it a third time. Now it becomes a part. But in many cases, I enjoy getting out of the mistakes because it takes me on a new adventure that I didn't expect. If everything happened the way I expected it, I'd probably be bored. a couple of these quotes here and I'm still bouncing around. Here's one of my favorites. When I need an idea, I create the feeling. Yeah. That was awesome. Can you speak on that? Sure. Sure. And um, I, I, say, I say to people, just think of this as a concept. Don't think about it as true and false. All right. And the, con the, the thought is this, the, con the question, the concept is this. People know what it feels like to get excited, to, to be inspired when you succeed at something, how you 
feel. Oh man, I, I achieved it. I got an A. I learned, I, 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 I practiced for a week and I finally learned this song, whatever. Um, I met this, this woman, this man, and oh, and it, my, my whole day was better, you know, whatever. I got a hundred dollars. I found a hundred dollar bill and I felt great. A lot of the times the feeling comes, we know what the feeling is after something good happens or after you get a good idea, you feel inspired. Well, if the action produces the feeling, is it possible that you can reverse it? If you know what the feeling feels like, create the feeling first. And if you can create the feeling first, will it produce the physical action or the physical outcome by producing the inner outcome or output first? Is it possible? I like to leave it as that. My answer is yes, it's possible. Um, and But I usually pose it as a question. But I know that it's possible. You can reverse the process. Let me get you down the road a little bit. A couple more quotes and then we'll get to some base stuff and we'll close up here. Got two more on the quote side, maybe three, because I want to talk about mom a little bit. I know mom was a awesome influence. Some of the quotes and things she said to you. Absolutely. And at the early ages, I'm sure you said, come on, mom, I'm 10. What do you think? <laughs> but here's one. But this is not the mom. I'm going to come to moms, but here's one. The best time to start living your life is now. Yeah. Well, I heard a quote one day that said the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The next best time is now. And the reason now is the best time for everything is because now is all, the, all we got. Right? There's another quote that says the past is history. The future is a mystery, but now is a gift. That's why it's called the present. So if you think about it, now is all we have. And by the time you think of now, it's gone. It's a new now. So the only time to do anything is now. All right? If you're doing anything else, you're thinking about it. All right? And we need to think about it. The past and the present is for thinking and feeling. If you want to do something, it can only be done now. So the best time really is the only time you can do anything is right now. What do you mean when you said be a leader among equals? Okay. I first heard Bela Fleck say that. It's the first time I heard that and I, and I kept it because it made sense. The name of the band was ba is, is Bela Fleck and the Flecktones. We still play together. We just don't do it as much. So Bela is, is the leader. You know, Bela Fleck, Flecktones. Fleck is in the name twice, right? So we know it's his band, but he treats us as equals. If he writes a new song, he doesn't say, okay, here's your part. Here's your drum part. He just plays it and let us respond. We get to play what we want. We have, we're allowed to have a first impression of his new song. That way it becomes a band song. Bela knows I'm a better bass player than him. He knows that Roy's a better drummer than him. Why are you going to write a drum part? Let me, let me write the bass part. He's smart, right? He's smart enough to listen to us, to ask our opinion, to help steer the direction of the band. Hey, we're going to play this thing. What do you guys think? But in the end, we can't come to an agreement. There's, it's good to have someone who can say, okay, look, guy, let's do this. Right? Every group needs that. Every team needs a team captain. But the team captain can't win the game by himself or herself. You need a team. So in the, in really, everybody's equal. But there's a leader. It doesn't mean the leader is above the rest. So the best way I've heard say what I'm taking too long to say is what Bela said, Bela Flex said. He said that I'm a leader, that he is a leader among equals. That's powerful. I like that. Here's one for you. What do 
it feel like five Grammys? What did it feel like when you got the call for the first one? The first one was special. Um, I mean, they're all special because it's your peers. This is not by fans. I mean, you know, I mean, a lot of your peers are fans. I'm fans of my peers. But this is the industry saying that you deserve it. That's amazing. It really is amazing, and especially when you grow up in a business and you're seeing the people before you winning these awards, and it's the most coveted award in the music business, and all of a sudden, you're there at the Grammy Awards. I want to talk about your mom. I mentioned her earlier, and I'm glad we've, we've been talking about her the last few minutes. She said something to you once that if it shook me up, and I'm way over here 100 years later, I'm sure at that age it must have rattled you. But here it is, paraphrasing. She says, what does the world need with just another great musician? You remember that? I do. I do. That is, that is one of the most popular phrases or questions that people know or quotes that people know of my mom. Uh, almost every year I go to a conference in January called the Gen Conference, J-E-N, Jazz Education Network. Um, and they actually printed it on a t-shirt one year. But mom and dad, it's both parents, just mom was more vocal. Dad was the quiet type. They were more important, more interested and felt it to be more important as to who we were or who you are as a person. Their main thing was that us knowing who we are and making sure that who we are is, is good. They felt, I believe, if they could generate five good boys, it wouldn't matter what we chose to do. It wasn't important to them. It wasn't special to them that we were musicians. It definitely wasn't special to them that we were good musicians. My mom would say, I heard her say, them, no, them boys ain't special because they play music. Oh, I don't know that, that because they're good musicians. She said, as much as they do it, they should be good. That don't surprise me. She said, What's, what makes me happy is that they're good people. And, and I believe her, and I think we all do. What the world needs are more good people. Now, if you have good people playing music, even better. But if you have good people doing anything, even better. Because what we do should be driven by our goodness. Then it doesn't matter what you do. And I think that's what a lot of people are not seeing when it comes to political officials. They're not seeing it being driven by the goodness of the person. It's a person trying to uphold a policy or gain more power or something like that. Victor, let's talk a little bit about endorsements. What gear are you using and so forth? Uh, what are you using? Bass, strings, so forth and so forth? Sure. Um, since 1983, I've been playing a Fodera bass. And that's F-O-D-E-R. F-O-D-E-R-A. Fodera. And this is one of them. This is not my very first one that I got in 83, but I was lucky enough lucky enough to find or we found each other in 1983 which happened to be the first year they were making basses so i was lucky enough to meet these guys in the beginning now they are like the rolls royce uh i don't know anything about cars like whatever the fancy car is tesla get lamborghini that's how they are in basses they are the main makers if you get a fodera you know you got something I had an idea one year, uh, years years ago, to, to have a bass look like a yin yang symbol, because I love yin yang symbols. So that's what this is on the body, as well as the headstock. You get the two sides. Um, so I've been playing Fodera basses since 1983. I'll play anything, but this is my comfort. And string wise, it's a company called DR, DR String. I say do right. DR strings. These are nickel strings. They are uh, they are 
They're called Pure Blues. They come in this package, Pure Blues. And uh, I use a gauge that is 40 on my G string, 50, no, uh, 40, 55, 75, and 95, which is the gauge I use. And I am using uh, Hartke, Hartke amps. I don't know if I can show you one. Um, I don't know if you can see this amp right, right there. That's a small Hartke. Um, but uh, that's the amplifiers that I use. But I will say this. You can use anything. This is just what I like. I find things that I can forget about. In other words, when I'm playing the bass, I can forget I'm even playing it because it feels so comfortable. The strings, I love the DR, the nickel strings. They glide around my hand. They don't stick. And I forget about it. If I had to play a gig and I keep turning around and adjusting my amp and trying to change the EQ, it's pulling me out of the center of music. So that amp's not doing its job. So the Harky amp, I can forget about. So I find gear that I can forget about. Victor, we do a thing on the show we call Word of Advice, where I ask the guests, I ask the artists if they leave a parting word of advice for the up-and-comers that's trying to get uh, into the game, into the industry, trying to get traction in this, in this industry, even the guys at the next level. But would you leave them a word of advice? A uh, word of advice. My mom pops into my head always and it'll be hard to just give a word um, but one of the things that pops into my mind is to if you can think about what you want to do with music and in many cases when you're young what you want to do with anything is self-serving I want to get better. I want to win a Grammy. I want to, you know, make a record, whatever. And I remember saying something to my mom about something I had done. And usually she's just really good at praising you and making you proud about what you did. But in this case, I told her what I wanted, what I had done. And she said, well, what's that got to do with me? Meaning, like, how does that make me any better? You know, was it all about you? And I said, wow, it is kind of selfish. So when you're looking at what you want to do in your life, your musical life, I'll keep it with music. How is it going to make anyone else better? How is it going to help anyone else? Because I believe if I can take my endeavor and show and see how it, other people are going to benefit, it's a more worthy endeavor. And then I'll just say this way, I will receive more invisible help. Because if what I'm going to do is going to help you, then I got your invisible help helping me as well as my own invisible help. If what I'm going to do is going to help the world, I've got the world's invisible help helping me do this thing. So strive not to just make yourself better, but to make the world better, to do something that's going to benefit other people. Yeah, um, that's one thing. And then don't do it for the award. Don't do it for the accolations from other people. Um, do it because that's what you have to do. Do it because it's the right thing to do. So that even if you don't get an award or any attention, you've still done what's right. Let's talk about your record company. Am I saying it right, Vix, Vic Records? Yeah, Vix, V-I-X. Mm -hmm. What's going on over there? Well, I just wanted to own my records. Um, there are, I've made a lot of records and there's a few of them that I'll never, I think I'll never own. And I, I didn't like the fact that a record exec's kids will end up owning my music and not my own kids. I want my kids to own my music, not somebody I don't even know's kids. I also want to know if a record sells for $10, where's that $10 go? How come I'm only getting 50 cents? Or if it's a good deal, how come I only get a dollar fifty? Where's the other 850 going? No record exec will answer that question. So it didn't make sense anymore more to me. I said, I'd rather make less money, but know where all of it is. Victor, 
What do you want your legacy to be, to be said, to be told? Well, <clears throat> this will sound weird, but I want to, I want people to think what they want to think about me because I, because I, I kind of don't think what you think about me is going to change whatever happens to me after I die. I think it's going to be about what I think of myself. I'm the one that has to live with me. And it's more for me, for me, the main question is what am I going to think of myself at my time? Um, because there's a lot of goodness out there where people, but uh, people have done great things and they should be happy, it seems, but they don't like themselves. But I hope people are, I, I hope people feel better because I was around. I hope that people's lives, I hope I've been able to add some joy and to make people proud and happy to have been alive at the same time. But I, even more than that, I hope that I can be happy with myself, even if people don't think that. You know, um, but as much as we want to be loved, that's not my main driving force. Because I can't decide what you think. That's not up to me. My job, what I can decide is to do my best in every moment. And I hope I can die proud and success, successful at that. Fantastic. As I close us up here, I just wanna say, uh, first let me say, uh, thank you so much for being on the Extraordinary Bass Player Show. I greatly appreciate it. And I've learned so much and so much. I said, I told you so to myself. And I got to say, I love that button. You got to send me how to get that button. Thing. <laughs> love it. We, we can um, talk about it sometime. Yeah. Yes, sir. So in closing, let me say again, thank you. Would you help us wave goodbye to all the fans out there? All right. Thank you all for listening and watching and supporting live music. We appreciate it. Sharon, thank you for supporting people like us musicians. You know, we live in a time where it used to be, Sharon, when we were young, television was free and, and we pay for our music. Now people want the music free and we happen to pay for television and a bunch of channels we don't watch. So we need people like you to, to let people know, look, this music that you want for free, there's real musicians making this stuff. And, you know, many of us have kids. I'm trying to put my, I got my youngest son, I got four kids, two in college, two out of college on a bass player's budget. So, you know, I say, you know, buy, support a musician, buy a record. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Victor. <laughs>